Moving on to the next the next artist, which and we also moving on to the next artist is James Brown. You may have heard of this guy. Some folks think he might be the most important artist of the 20th century. Um, before it is impossible to do a bio that would not go too long for James Brown. So I think what I'm going to try to do, because the album we're covering today, Live at the Apollo, which was recorded in 1962 and released in 1963, really represents an early stage of James Brown's career. And it represents a stage of James Brown's career that is before the career that might be considered his most mainstream portion of his career. Um, Mm -hmm. And so that is a big thing to know about this album because a good way to describe this album is this is when James Brown was still playing music that was infused by gospel and R and B. And he was playing it almost exclusively for an African-American audience. And he was still charting because that's how popular his music was in venues that were African-American venues. So even when he was having to compete with, you know, for for lack of a better way of putting it, British folks and white folks, uh, you know, lovingly appropriating that sound and making it more palatable to the mainstream audience, James Brown's album still sold enough that this album hit number two on the charts. So that is one thing I want to say real quick. Before, uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, before you get too deep, John, what songs did you pick that uh, em- embody that sound? That is a, a, a wonderful thing uh, for, for you to ask me right there. So um, when I, uh, it, it was one of the hardest things to do on the album was to figure out which song to make the representative song because the whole performance is kind of what the mm-hmm. single is. You know what I mean? It, so it doesn't, it doesn't pop out at you as having like a big single. So I kind of had to like settle for a single uh, for the first time. And I normally kind of pride myself on picking the single, but I did go with, I don't mind as the opening montage song. And then the song that I guess we're going to play right now um, would be, um, I- I'm going to go, I-, I think with uh, try me is going to be the song I'm going to use to start off. And thanks for that heads up, Josh. Normally I'm good at hitting my cues, but James Brown got me a little bit, uh, worked up there so uh before i kind of go into a little bit of the basics familiarity with james brown guys either one of you guys can start would you say he's like i know him but this was a chance to kind of dig into what made him james brown i know him very well where, where would you say you stood on your knowledge of james brown coming in i think i only knew him from kind of the later period mm-hmm. and and uh and just his kind of infamous like drug use and mm-hmm. Uh, or getting trouble with the law, quote unquote. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's all I knew. I knew him from Rocky Four. <laughs> Living in America? <laughs> yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. That was probably my first, you know, like, who is this guy? He's going nuts. Uh, but yeah, I mean, not a whole lot. Not a, I, I, you know, singles, uh, name, reputation, are some articles that I've read, but not a whole lot musically. So this was all new to me. So, so let's talk about what makes James Brown, James Brown up to 1962, okay? Because instead of going into the bio, I, I think you can kind of guess it. He grew up dirt poor in the South. <laughs> you know, he caught a charge for armed robbery when he was in jail. He started a gospel group. One of the members of that group who became a longtime band member, his family helped him to get out of jail and sort of rehabilitate. And then he joined what was called the Chitlin Circuit, which was basically playing a ton of live shows for primarily African-American audiences in cities and areas that had large African-American populations. Uh, And I think it's important we're using the vernacular of today, um, African-American, but like, you know, for a guy that wrote a song, uh, you know, I'm black and I'm proud, you know what I mean? At that time, it was clearly defined as black music, you know what I mean? And Mm. black in the sense of tied to the American black experience. So Mm. I do want to say that like that, is a big piece of what makes James Brown during this era James Brown. So why is James Brown important? Well, let's talk about some of the things that make him, you know, transcendent. First, he created a stage show that is filled with the type of things that have become cliched nowadays that at the time were revolutionary from the person introducing him, which you will hear on this album, you know, the long introduction of the hardest working man in show business, Mr. Showtime, going into all of his different nicknames and then them playing the music start and stop before he comes out. Um, He had at times a 30 piece band 
that was known for being one of the sharpest and tightest bands going. He had multiple bassists, multiple guitarists, several percussionists for the slow songs, a string, uh, a, a whole string section, a brass section. You had him, of course, himself. He normally had a female singer who he would duet with. Plus, he had his group at this at this point and then later that was called the Flames. Uh, that was basically the equivalent of almost like a Motown background group singing mm-hmm. behind him, a gospel group. So you're getting 30 to 50 people associated with this sound. Um, so that whole idea of this stage show that was larger than life was huge. Um, his singing style that merged that gospel sound and the screaming uh, was unique because it was designed to be tuneful but also jarring that's another thing his timing was off the charts in terms Mm. of when he would sing things and modulate his voice uh the fact that he both sang and danced in equal measures live not choreographed (laughs) was another thing that was unique about him um he's the most sampled artist in hip-hop history so he had another life afterwards especially in the 80s and 90s you know james brown was sampled constantly Um, And he's also considered to be a forerunner of two huge shifts in popular music, but in particular black popular music. He's the forerunner of turning what was the R&B of gospel and blues into what would be called soul music in the 60s. And then he would turn that soul music as the 70s hit into funk music, Um, even Mm. even employing the Collins brothers. Uh, as part of his second band after his first band kind of, I think, you know, ran out of steam and kind of James Brown was too much of a taskmaster and there were some pay issues. So he just created a second band that had the Collins brothers in it. Now trivia for those listening, but also those on the podcast right here, who did the Collins brothers end up uh, becoming known for being members of? Cause they spun off to their own band, which was quite a revolutionary band in their own right. No clue. I don't know, Earth, Wind, and Fire? I don't know. Good guess, but Parliament Funkadelic would be what they spun off into. So um, in many ways, James Brown birthed Parliament Funkadelic, who Mm -hmm. in many ways birthed what would be considered that 70s funk sound. Um, That that is some of the reasons why he's known for what he's known for. The cape routine, where they bring out the cape (laughs) and put it over him, is another thing that was the showmanship of that it was yeah. not something you saw very often. I, I think it was kind of like, you know, for what Elvis was for white fans, you know, James Brown sort of filled that, that in for, um, for black fans. And also, you know, he began to cross over in the mid sixties. That's when he's doing, I feel good. And Papa's got a brand new bag. But what we're talking about today is before any of that attempt yeah. to cross over, this is, this live album was designed to show him, playing to a black art, a black audience playing what would be considered to be black music, gospel music, soul music, R and B in the sense of it being played in sort of the raw or edgier version of it. Um, his record label did not want him to release a live album because live albums were known for not selling well. And their take was basically like people have heard all these songs. So why would they buy a live album with it in it? He fought them on that and basically said no and self-funded it himself and it ended up being incredibly mm. successful rising to number two on the charts good uh, for that, him that didn't really that didn't really impress the members of king recording his record label and so he decided to just record another album for, for another record label yeah. because he was having different stuff and that cost him most of 1964 um as his music was being held up uh, he still was able to play live, though, relentlessly. And one thing to know about James Brown is he toured relentlessly, mm. as in over 300 shows a year. And when we're talking about shows, the James Brown show was all of those pieces traveling, right? The 50-some-odd members, him going full out every night, dancing full out every yeah. single night. Um, just it, it was well known as being one of if not the most impressive stage show that exists. Uh, We did post stuff on the combing the Twitter this week of uh, a performance uh, that James Brown did right before uh, the Rolling Stones had to follow him. And uh, notoriously (laughs) after putting on an incredible performance, James Brown turned to them on the way out and said, follow that motherfuckers, which kind of like embodied his competitiveness in terms of um, 
his uh his his act and how much he he prided it so that kind of is 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 the why James Brown is important and where he's at early in his career. I mean, there's a thousand other reasons why James Brown is important besides the singles. Um, you know, he did, of course, in the 80s and 90s, as Josh mentioned, kind of become sort of a a caricature in some ways because of his legal issues. He was well known for abstaining from from drugs and alcohol in the 60s and 70s, but by the 80s, unfortunately. Mm. Uh, that had caught up with him and especially crack had caught up with him. Yeah. And there were, there were four divorces and anywhere from, I believe it was 10 to 13 kids um, that became kind of a messy legal situation when he passed away. But through all of that, um, he maintained his, his reputation um, as a voice for the black community. Um, it, I would be remiss if I did not mention that, that, um, you know, if you were to take a, a current take on him, there were some problematic issues with women throughout his career, most notably Tammy Terrell, who I think most people will know for her various debuts with uh, me, duets with uh, Otis Redding in the mid and late 60s. Mm-hmm. Um, quite a few of them. A- Ain't No Mountain High Enough would probably be the most famous of those, uh, but there's a lot of good stuff there. And uh, poor Tammy Terrell, she she dated James Brown when she was in his show as a 17-year-old. That oh. did not go well. She then dated the uh, lead singer of The Temptations. That also did not go very well. Um, she was beginning to find some peace toward the end of her life and unfortunately died very, very young. I believe either 22 or 23 years old um, from brain cancer. Um, oh, and, uh, but some of the stuff that, that she did was pretty remarkable. Um, in her career, so she's someone to look up. But yeah, uh, let's stop there because it's it's. I could keep going on and on and on. The one thing I will say is this was recorded at New York's Apollo Theater. Um, it does feature an introduction by Fats Gonder, which was sort of the MC of the Apollo. What a great um, name! They, people mm-hmm. need to start naming kids Fats again. Yep, Fats. We can Gonder. start calling you Fats. One callback <laughs> we talked about when we covered. <laughs> MC5's uh, Kick Out the Jams and Wayne Kramer did say uh, that entire album was based on James Brown. We listened to Live at the Apollo endlessly on acid. We would listen to that in the van in the early days of eight tracks on the way to gigs to get us up for the gig. If you played in a band in Detroit in the days before MC5, everybody did Please, Please, Please and I Go Crazy. These were standards. We modeled every MC5 performance on those records. Everything we did on a gut level about sweat and energy, it was anti-refinement. That was what we were consciously going for, and that's what that album stood for. Mm -hmm. So as a callback to that album, that's kind of the ethos that was going on there. Yep. All right. So let's. uh, last time we started with me, so we can start with either of you guys this time. Matt, because you haven't presented yet, what were your thoughts on this album? Eh. I hate saying that. that Oh, I'm, I'm... I'm glad you said that. Uh, okay. Okay. I, again, I, my, my knowledge of James Brown is not by any stretch ex- expansive, right? Um, I was, I'm disappointed in this record. I thought I was going to like it more. I wanted to like it more. And I don't know if it's because it was a live album. Um, it just didn't do much for me. Um, in, in particular, because a third of the album is that track lost someone it's over 10 minutes long and it's it's just boring it's the same thing over and over again it's a slower song it's just the horns of dun, 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 dun. and i was just like this is still going like the first time i listened to it, i was like geez how long has it been i was like wow that's just a long a long time i'm not a fan and i've never been a fan of um in at live shows like one of my one of my favorite you know bands in the '90s, Green Day, always does this where they like do the shout and response things with the audience, and mm-hmm. I'm just like, stop doing that. Just play the music. Like I hate that, you know. And this whole all this stuff with like, I'm gonna tell you something, boom. I'm gonna tell you something, boom. And they does that over and over again, and I'm just like, it doesn't, it doesn't. I'm just like, all right, just get on, do the show, right? Um, so. The, some of the song, I mean, it was fine, right? It, I didn't, I didn't hate it, but I, well, it didn't really do a whole lot for me. And then Josh sent the, the the message about the live shows and stuff earlier today, 
And I looked at some of that. I was like, holy crap, this guy's insane. He's yeah. dancing. And the, and the thing you talked about, John, with the coat, you know, like put, you know, doing the, the or the cape or whatever. Right. It's the performance was was crazy. And his dancing was crazy. And I don't know if I've ever really seen it like that before. And then I just started thinking about the concept of this would be a really fun show to see live. And I would mm-hmm. it would be a totally different experience based on all that performance stuff that you're talking about, John. Um, but I find that that happens with me even today. There are certain artists that I, I love. They're my, I would love, I love listening to them. And then I see their shows and I'm like, eh, you know, they're not great performers. The music's good, but they're just kind of standing there, you know? And then there's artists that like, I'm not a huge fan of their music. And then I see them live and I'm like, wow, that was freaking crazy. What a great show. I think this would fall into that category for me. I also think that, if it were a studio album, I think that there's other stuff that maybe James Brown did in the 60s and throughout his career in the studio with the production, with a, maybe more focus for that studio. Well, that would be the that would be the mid 60s and late 60s. Okay. That's when all the James Brown songs that you'd be familiar with start. Yeah, to show I think that, I would but. like that a heck of a lot more than this. This was just this fell flat to me. Um, and it just I. I wasn't feeling it. The screaming and the, the fat ceiling too. the fans, like the production of this, I, I, you know, I can't fault them for it. It was the sixties. They didn't really have the best recording equipment, but the, 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 the fan screaming was a little too much in the recording for me. And it, 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 it just, it was kind of annoying to be honest. Um, so I, I'm very lukewarm on this album as a whole. I am pretty much on the same page as you with this. I am, I find it hard to believe that this is the album that's, james brown's best ever album um i feel like this there's got to be something you know from that mid to late period that's probably better sounding or or more you know have more uh representative of his talent um i i feel like this album fails to capture what it was trying to do in that you know show the power of his live show from those clips that that we watched and mentioned um, because seeing those was like a whole different thing compared to this album. Yes. Um, You get the power of his voice. um, You get like his pure talent, you get the crazy dancing. um, And none of that is captured in this album. Um, I appreciate that, uh, you know, like kind of the sex appeal that he has and like how the fans were screaming and stuff. And I think that that captured it. uh, The album captured that well. But this album is is really strangely constructed in that, like, most of the songs, like, the last three songs are, like, the only actual music for the most part on this album. Um, and then it's, like, very, like, short segments of transitioning and and um, and it, it's almost too short of an album. I feel like I didn't get anything um, music-wise from, from this album, um, which is kind of strange. Um, so, yeah, I would say go, you know, watch the live performances to see what James Brown's like. And I'm going to dig in and listen to some of his other albums around this period to see if there's something better out there um, that that is more captures what I know he's capable of, clearly. Gotcha. I um. I I, I think that all that you guys said is is relevant. I do think it's at times it's an odd selection of songs to try to in a live album. I think you're trying to get the ethos for what I'm overusing that word, but the sort of the essence of what, um, what a live act is. And I think this album does it in some ways and doesn't in others. It doesn't capture the music in a way that I would want it to. And the quality mm-hmm. of the song is, is not as good, but also at this time he was not doing the type of songs that mm-hmm. I think, I can't, and and this is one thing I think I have that I have to kind of point out: the way that that white artists did black R and B took a lot of the gospel out of it mm-hmm. and a lot of the church out of it, and defaulted more into the blues of it, which made it more tight and rhythmic, right? And and a little bit less about the raw emotion and a little bit more about the musicianship or the structure. This is sort of R and B being done raw. And it's, as, it's, oh, yeah. I almost look at this as like an appetizer that gets you excited about going to a James Brown show. Cause it, it, it's like, it's like a 30 minute sermon. 
is, is the best mm-hmm. way I can describe this album. Um, and that's why it's a hard one to evaluate because you would like it fleshed out with, with more and perhaps weightier songs. I don't know, though, if you don't get some of the essence of what a James Brown show is like. And when you think of it in the context of 1962, my God, the fact that this was being played on popular, this had to sound nothing like what right. else was being played. Because, you know, as much as we love the Beatles, right, and as much as we love the Stones, the way that they're doing R&B is not how James Brown is doing no. it. In fact, in fact, I would argue that a lot of the covers from the British Invasion bands, most of the time their weakest ones are almost always James Brown songs. And I yeah. think that's because how do you sing a James Brown song like James Brown, right? You know, it's one thing to take the beat, especially when James Brown starts doing funk, you know, or other stuff, but to try to sing like James Brown, like, I mean, who can do that? You know, it's just such a unique thing. And even when you're covering it, you have to have that gospel sound with impeccable timing. And you also have to leave enough space for your, your band to be totally participatory and not just a band like a 30 to 50 piece you know orchestral arrangement in some ways um i i i think i i think i fall more on the side of where you guys are that i was hoping for a little bit more i don't know if i was as down on it as you guys though because i was able to find stuff that i really enjoyed as pieces and i looked at it very much as a live album that was an appetizer to the show and also played into a little bit of the myth making of the artist in the way that say Folsom County prison does for Johnny cash. You know, mm-hmm. it's just, it's as much about establishing the act. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I, this isn't, this wouldn't be, I hear what you're saying about the gospel aspect of it. And, and I think that's a valid point, but, that's not even really apparent on this album. Like any of the couple of songs at the beginning, like I'll go crazy and try me that are about only two minutes long each. Why mm-hmm. not stretch those to six and then like have that gospel aspect incorporated into the track. Um, there's so many, like I think there were so many opportunities to capture what he want, what he was like on this album that they didn't accomplish. Yeah, and I felt like please, 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 and you've got the power, and I found someone is when he starts veering into sounding like early James Brown, and yeah. it's, and and that's when you know that and the and the night train follows that. Um, right before mm-hmm. that is I don't mind, and to me that's the stretch of the album that you know that you guys do mention that lost someone is oddly placed in the middle of the album. Uh, it's just it's, not. It's, yeah. It's it's oddly placed. I, I didn't hate it as much as, as the other guys did because I looked at it as almost like the intermission to some degree that kind of, you know, here's the part where James Brown's going to do the theatrics and I kind of know what that looks like. Right. So I, I kind of could imagine it. But yeah, the track five is I Don't Mind. Track seven's that medley of what I consider to be three pretty good songs and then Night Train and, uh, and, and you know, even like later on, like Lost Someone uh, is a song I really like at, at track 11 too. So th- there's... There's jewels there, Track but eleven. I, oh, you went you went further. I, I went further, right? Yeah. Oh, okay. The, the, I stopped. Yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah. the lost someone, and that, and I think that helps a little bit because some of the stuff that gets tacked on, lost someone, I'll go crazy, or a little bit. Is tighter. that lost someone just a shorter version of the of the of the track six? Yep, it's God. basically if you cut out all the the act, like because uh, oh. what you realize when you listen to that is seven minutes of the lost someone extended version of it. Is basically the showman. It's setting up the showmanship. It's it's that's as, as much to introduce the band and show all the stuff that the band can do in the theatrics. But then the the two minute and forty one second version yeah. that's on there, the single mix, is basically just the James Brown piece. You know, and that's and and I totally see what you're saying, and that's all well and good. And if that's what you're going to see at a show, I'm all you know, that's fine, right? Yep. Like shows are different, especially after seeing those those videos. But if I'm going to listen to an album, no, I, I don't want that. You know, like yeah, it's, but it's, it was a different, it was a different era. You know what I mean? Like radio would play this album in entirety, and it was almost like a tease to get you to see the show. Like, did you like that for the thirty minutes? Right. Okay. And and, and yeah. yeah, and and in this context now, you know, right, it's it's not going to hold up, especially when we're talking about the best ever albums, right? Yeah. But, Which is but why like, I think that's what I'm saying is like I would I was I was expecting 
for more and hoping for more. I want to learn more about James Brown. I want to get into it. Like kind of like the way it was with Aretha Franklin, you know, and as soon as I heard that, right. I was like, this is great. You know, like I need to listen more. And I didn't get that at all with this. Um, well, but remember you were listening to Aretha Franklin at the crossover period of her career and James Brown has that period as well in the mid sixties. Are we getting to that? Do we, do we do more? No, we, do, we don't. We talk, do not know. And, and like, that's I, what I'm you know, saying. That's not right. I feel, I feel good. And pop has got a brand new bag, right? Those are songs that probably you recognize pretty much instantaneously. And those are exactly the type of songs that were designed to cross over. And when we say crossover, let's call it what it is. White crossover people. to white audiences. That's what, what it is. I and that was, what Are- that was what Aretha was doing on Lady Soul, yeah. even though it has soul in it. Um, if you listen to early, early Aretha, she's, she's tied to the church more there, you know, and by yeah. 65, she's, you know, and, and the interesting thing is that rock critics have long said that for a long period of time, rock writers said, you know, oh, when we talk about soul, it's Aretha Franklin, Otis Redding, and, you know, James Brown is kind of just this thing, right? He was a live performance and, you know, he is what he is. But then it wasn't really until like hip hop started sampling him and, and calling him out as the guy in soul that some of the rock writers had to sort of revise it. And, and let's be honest, I think a lot of that is that a lot of the rock writers were, were white and this, yeah. you know, this, this is a black album yeah. in a way that, that other albums are not. And that, you know, I'm not saying that that's getting in the way of you guys enjoying it because I think that there's legitimate arguments regardless of whoever you are, but, this doesn't sound like the R and B that you know, the Beatles and the Stones and stuff are churn and the Kinks are churning out, like yeah. a, a year later. You know, they're doing a different. T- they're doing more of an Elvis take on it, you know, than they are a uh, or even like a more upbeat uh, Little Richard take. You know. So what is so yeah. John? What's the main selling point of this being the highest rated James Brown album? Is it the fact I think that- the in- the influence of it? is the mm-hmm. fact that it, it sprung James Brown into being a, a I, I think this is one of those albums that it's, we talked about sometimes an album, like for the David Bowie album, right? It's on there because of his name. I don't know if this one's on there for James Brown's name so much as like when it hit, what it did to establish James Brown and the R&B soul emerging sound as a, a thing in popular music. He, he was able to take the the version of R and B and blues and gospel merge them together and make it something palatable that it could chart. And mm-hmm. then in the next couple of years, he would be able to take that and not only be able to do that, but he'd be able to cross over with it while still maintaining a level of credibility in the African American community that, you know, other groups they didn't lose, but you know what I mean? They kinda had to tread on to get there. And then Radis, he was kind of getting to the point with the soul where he was going to do it. That you know, then he creates funk, which you know <laughs> right. goes in a totally different direction. And you know, once again, you know, becomes established with being just mainstream enough to be on the palette of you know critics and people who love music, but also still somewhat of a subgenre. You know, mm-hmm. and that was what James Brown was until the late seventies. Then, of course, he became sort of like playing for. He had money issues and, you know, he was making just a lot of songs to be able to, you know, capitalize. And they weren't even all bad songs, you know, like Living in America was certainly, you know, positive enough. But that is a song that's designed for the palate of someone watching Rocky Four, you know, not this. It's such, a, it's such an upbeat song for such the uh, beginning of such a sad scene. Yes. Well, <laughs> you know, it's yes. We're Apollo. He hey, speaking of movies too, Josh, did you notice that Night Train had the saxophone part from the uh, the band in the in Back to the Future at the Enchantment Under the Sea dance? <laughs> no, I didn't. It totally that's was. Good, it totally was. That's I was like, pop. that's the beginning of the Enchantment Under the Sea <laughs> well, dance with, with uh, Marvin from Marvin Berry, Chuck Berry's Marvin cousin. Barry. <laughs> and I will. I will end with this. The it's a perfect way to end, Matt, because the idea of. Did you notice that thing in that James Brown song that this other person did is as much a part of James Brown's legacy as anything else? Because yeah. he is sampled, derivated from, you know, yeah. so much of his DNA is in so many different genres of music that continue to be played today that that is almost as, along with the live performance and his body of work, that is almost as much a part of his legacy as 
you know, the music he made and the live performance, hardest working man in show business persona. It's hard to figure out what's what's the James Brown that's most influential because right. all three of them well, are there. I was mm-hmm. uh, I was the, I was also kind of hoping when I saw Night Train, I was like, oh, wait a minute. Does this mean that Guns N' Roses? <laughs> no, nope, that this? is not. I was, that like, not I was like, oh, it's not <laughs> the same song. OK, is that no, unfortunately. <laughs> Unfortunately for you, that was not what they were going for. Josh, didn't you one. say you wanted that song played at your funeral? Yes. Yeah. I'm putting it in the will. Yeah. <laughs> and they and they did cover Mama Kin from early Aerosmith, oh. which is going to be a great testament to if Mac can hold up his I Hate All Aerosmith uh, so, uh, album. I don't. I don't. 70s. That's more of a stick. Yeah. I'll admit that right now. So. But anyway. But we'll, we'll, we'll tie it off right there because I, I would say if you were unfamiliar with James Brown, you know, maybe don't pick this one up because as as Matt and Josh fairly make the criticism of, it's a little lean on music and a little heavy in terms of promo for the live show. And there are visual live shows that I think really give you the full Monty of what you're looking for. And if you're looking for more accessible James Brown music for your palette to start, that mid-60s era James Brown could be what you're looking for. But, but you know, if if you're... You could also go into that late 60s, early 70s, like, you know, Sex Machine, Funk, James Brown, which is also damn catchy. Um, and so either one of those places would probably be a better place to start. But uh, I, once you've had your palate wet, that's when you can move backwards. I think that he probably can lay claim more to the inventing sex funk than Tim Buckley can, though. Like, that's I just would, a guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, he, he can, certainly the funk part of it. And to me, sex and funk are pretty much synonymous. I mean, even the term funk, right? to some degree lines up with well i mean that's we, we know where funk comes from right the smell of sex that's what funk music is supposed to represent right there you go if you didn't know send that us, if you say so listeners send us your tiktoks of james brown dancing like i'm doing right now oh josh is getting down <laughs> that's pretty good josh <laughs> no but they should totally see the videos you're absolutely <laughs> yeah. right because those are awesome like go yeah. watch go don't listen go to the, the, the mashed yeah. the mashed potato and the splits and oh all. my yeah. god yeah. he's oh yeah, yeah this looks great awesome. it's great i like the one the one foot dancing thing that he does yep. awesome too. <laughs> all kinds of stuff <laughs> can't teach uh, that all right